Hello, sports fans. So, um, one thing some of you might have noticed with some of the episodes is I will wear glasses at certain times and I won't wear glasses at others. Um, that's MS. It plays with mostly my right eye and of course my left leg. I don't know why it's crossed around like that, but who knows, maybe it's being autistic. Which brings me to the point of this episode. What are the early signs of autism? All right, so one of the first signs you're gonna see with autism is just a lack of, I guess you might say communication. So we will communicate, but you'll see more body language communication than you will verbal communication. So just basically a distance and an, an innate focus on whatever the heck we're doing. So, ooh, plane. Oh my gosh, I haven't seen one of those planes in forever. That's being autistic. Like noticing that, noticing the sound, and just being like, oh my gosh, that's a single prop plane. You know what? I might not cut that out. So what are some of the early signs of autism? Number one, you're gonna see a social disconnect. You will, you'll find that we become immersed into something that we like or are doing to the point where we may not be able to hear you. And this carries through our adolescent life and often through our um, prepubescent and pubescent life. So what do I mean by that? I remember playing a video game and according to my mother, when I was, I think, yeah, 11 years old, she was yelling in my ear, like not five feet away from me. She was yelling at me according to her. I could not hear her because I was so focused on that game that I was really good at. She ended up walking up and turning it off and I said, why did you do that? I was on a roll, I had a high score. And the reason she said was because I was ignoring her. It wasn't purposeful, it was built in. So <laughs> that, that's, that's one question. <laughs> do autists have a sense of humor? The answer is no. Um, my parents were poor, they couldn't pay for the upgrade. So no, autists don't have a sense of humor. I actually saw that question on Reddit and I'm just like, oh, wow, okay, that's a thing. Why do people diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, ASD, which, get rid of the D. I mean, yeah, some people like the D. I'm not a huge fan of the D. So just get rid of the D on that one. So why do people diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder sometimes have a difficult time making eye contact? It's actually a really good question. In a previous episode, I tell you that we notice everything. Kind of like that plane over there, like, ooh, that's a single prop and I recognize the sound okay I now I have to leave that in the video the reason we have hard a hard time looking at people's faces is because we take everything in you heard the phrase a picture is worth a thousand words right your face is worth so many more than that it's worth a thousand pictures when we see your face there there's a lot of things going on number one there's the wear around your eyes there is the placement and enlargement of your eyes. There is um, the directional focus of your eyes and the muscles around your eyes. And I'm just talking about your eyes. I'm like, hey, we're talking micro expressions. My kind are built to read micro expressions. There are so many things going on in your face that it just, it takes so much. It, it takes so much processing power. We, we absorb everything, but the further on the spectrum you go, it, it's like taking, Right now I'm using an SD card in this camera, right? If I used an older style of SD card, it would give you an image here and there. It wouldn't move that fast, but it would move fast. It'd still record the audio, right? But this camera has one of the best SD cards you can get. So it's just brrrm. Imagine that brrrm, that, that nonstop images, but you have to take in every bit of those images. It's hard to explain. Um, and it's something that I had to train out of myself at a young age, is maintaining certain types of eye contact. Like I have to focus on a single eye when I'm look, making eye contact with somebody. I have to, because there's just so much information going on. And I, I've been studying psychology for over 12, 20 years, over 20. and. <laughs> There's just, there's so much going on just in your face. Not your body language, not your tone, nothing else, just your face. And to, to be able to focus on all of that is, is a challenge because there's so much information. Like even now, my training, and fellow autists, follow me on this one, okay? Focus on the color of their eyes. That's the easiest way to get through that to where you can actually stare at somebody in the face. And then you can even switch eyes, but keep your focus on their eyes. It makes it so much easier. 
here, here's, I'm relating to my fellow autists right now, but focus on the color of their eye. So you're focusing on one eye. Don't try to focus on both. That's, that's not going to work unless you're focusing literally on the bridge of their nose, the crack of the bridge of their nose. But if you focus outside of that, you're, you're going to still run into being overwhelmed, but focusing on a single eye helps. And the reason I say that is um, focusing on a single eye a, a allows the level of detail that we're used to absorbing without overwhelming us with all of the things that are going on in your face. I mean, just look at my mouth. When I talk, my mouth is constantly going and it's constantly moving. And it's showing inflection, it's showing glee, it's showing disappointment. All of these different things we take in in spades. And so being able to focus on a single point makes it so much easier for us. It really does. How does visual processing impact someone with ASD? Well, number one, get rid of the D. I'm sorry, like, if this is a relationship, we're breaking up because you're not getting the D anymore. Um, calling it a disorder is, is ignoring the other side of the spectrum. So you have the um, societal spectrum or social aptitude side. And for example, go onto Facebook and look at the two sides of, hey, is, do I like Trump or do I not like Trump? Look at both sides and you'll see just such passion, such impulsivity. They see an article or a comment, they just get them on both sides, okay? We see um, social aptitude as its own disability because you guys are reactive. We don't react like that. But of course, I mean, me saying that just offended some of you. And that's part of the disorder, okay? Um, you guys are on the social side of things. You're like, hey, I'm getting along with people. I'm around people. I'm going to be doing things with people. Yay! And we're over here saying, I can do things with things and I can make things really cool and I can make this more efficient and oh my gosh, I'm going to study into this. We're not worried about talking to you guys. I mean, we'd like to be your friends. I think we can be friends. You want to be friends? But we're focused on the mechanical side of things and you guys are focused on the people side of things. Like, how do they react to me? Oh my gosh, are they judging me? No, I don't want to be labeled as that. Okay, that's, that's how we see it. <laughs> that's how my kind see it, at least the ones that are functional that I know. <laughs> Sticking to the question, how's visual uh, processing impacts someone with ASD or with AS, excuse me. Well, there's a catch to that. I spy. That, there we go. I spy. So, you know those I spy books where I spy with my little eye a blank. And they give you these little puzzles, these abstract puzzles where it could be I see an angel or three angels. Those three angels may not be an actual object. They might be a shadow, right? we would take that in. My kind, we're built for puzzles. We're built for games like that. Um, you put me down with an I Spy book, I will find everything. I will. Because it's interpretive and it, it's random. It's, it's a curious puzzle. That's how we look. We don't see, I gotta push myself back for a second. Right now I see tree line plus a big tree with lighter leaves in the background, right? My kind would focus on that leaf, that leaf, that leaf. Ooh, bird, nest, leaf, or a series of leaves, leaves. Or, wow, that's an intricate structure of branches. Okay, that, that's how my kind would see that tree. You guys would say, wow, that's such a beautiful tree. I can't wait till autumn and it's just all pretty and, and nice. That's the difference. We are mechanical. We, we look at things from a functional perspective or mechanical perspective. And you guys look at things from an um, aesthetic perspective. You know, what's funny is um, I read this, this article that people are more likely to donate to protect an endangered species if that animal is considered attractive. Like the blobfish, nobody wants to donate to protecting those guys, right? I think that that very well depicts the societal or the, the social side of the spectrum. Because the spectrum is wide. And I'm detailing that. Um, in fact, I, I've already got a diagram for it. Yeah, it, it, the way that we process is very mechanical. Do people with, an aut with autism spectrum disorder, get rid of the D word, um, suffer from intellectual disability? No. In fact, it is the exact opposite. 
we suffer from social disability, meaning we aren't as social as you guys are. We're not as socially aware. We don't care as much about what other people think. We really don't. If people constantly said, oh, you're evil, you're evil, you're evil, but they were just nice to us otherwise, it wouldn't affect us. Where we see the effect or how we respond is when you take action on saying, you're disabled. But I mean, we could flip the script and say you're disabled too, because I mean, look at how reactive people are. And okay, there's a crash on the side of the road. Do you have to slow down and watch it? I mean, it, it's a two-sided coin, coin. And I happen to be on the side with tails. And I'm okay with that. Now, if I said you guys happen to get the side with tails, getting the side with tails instead of heads, that's considered le inferior, right? That's considered less desirable. It's considered that by you guys. We don't care. It's a coin. And that, that's, that's the big difference is we don't, we don't really care um, about, about things, um, and we don't necessarily care about the opinions of people unless those opinions directly impact us, impact our quality of life, impact our ability to get things done. I mean, is there an intellectual disability? Not at all. In a autistic mind, in an autistic mind, excuse me, we are scatterbrained but that's because we're loaded with so much information, so much processing. Because I mentioned in a different episode, if you want to show, put two autists in the room and have them strike up a conversation. It will go crazy. It's awesome. And both parties will follow it, but you guys won't be able to follow it. And one of the challenges that we have is we get so much information. Like a, a second ago that I'm going to be cutting out, um, or that I've already cut out, I paused for about 10, 15 seconds because I was overwhelmed with information. And that's kind of the problem, is it's not a disability, it's a different type of ability. Just like um, a pro athlete. Okay, you're not born a pro athlete. I don't care who you are, you're not born being able to throw a perfect spiral. You ha if you refine your natural abilities, your natural aptitude, like, hey, you're big, you're capable of being strong, because, but if you don't work out, how are you gonna be strong and strong enough to compete, right? You have to work out, you have to train, you have to practice, and it's the same thing with us. Um, we have to train and practice our minds to be able to communicate effectively and to do the things that we wanna do, but that's with everybody. And we learn certain things a lot quicker than you guys do. If it's mechanical or scientific in nature, oh yeah, we're gonna stomp it before you will, long before you will. But if it's literature or writing and all of that, yeah, you guys are gonna probably mop the floor with us. The writing is a social aptitude, and the sciences are a mechanical aptitude. I mean, it's that simple, honestly. And different people have different talents. Like, some people are built, better built to be a baseball player, and some are better built to be a football player. I'm better built for piecing together really big pathological puzzles, and I know some people on the spectrum that are just naturally built to clean house when it comes to math. Oh my God. The things that these people can do, <laughs> just off the top of their head, it's amazing. We are all gifted in our own way, and that's something that I, I wish the scientific or the psychological community would appreciate. But no, um, my kind don't have an intellectual disability, we have a social disability. I think part of the reason that they claim that my kind have an intellectual disability overall, like blanket approach, ch -ch Yep, they all have it because of this one, this one, this one, this one, this one. When you go at it from a shotgun approach, which is what the psychological community is doing, if you look at any of the studies and their suppositions, I mean, how many times have they interviewed somebody like me in depth? But granted, there aren't too many people like me. Somebody who is autistic but loves psychology. That's kind of rare. And social aptitude is how we communicate. So let's say you're a psychologist interviewing somebody like me, you'll get the same type of answers that you'll get asking a person like any of you, um, assuming you're not autist. <laughs> when we ask you, what's it like to be drunk? You're gonna get a different answer from every single person because the experience is very individual and every person is an individual. We're all unique. That's why we all have unique fingerprints. To, to claim a disability is to ignore the fact that it's just a different type of ability. Plain and simple. And sometimes we have barriers in communication that can be trained out of us, the same way that you train an athlete, okay? And, and I'll give you a great example. Football players, right? 
there was a period where football players were being taught ballet. Why? Because it increased their balance, it increased their ability to minimize injuries and to be more agile on the field. That's us. Yeah, you can, you can load us up with the, weight, the mental weightlifting, but you know what? A little bit of ballet probably wouldn't hurt. And that's kind of what this channel is for, is to teach people how to teach my kind a few tricks on coping with what we are. That's why I say, look at their eye. Because the eye is a detailed enough item that it will hold our attention. That allows us to speak to you, looking you in the eye, which is a social expectation that you guys force upon us. Like, hey, they don't look at us. They look me in the face. Look me in the face. Okay, parents, that is not the thing you should be saying to your kids if they're autistic. It, it basically forces them to be a mentally uncomfortable, if not in a type of mental pain. So it's either a type of mental pain or just a, an extreme level of discomfort for some of us. And that's why we have such a hard time looking you in the eyes. And so to my fellow autists, look into an eye. Look at the color of it, like right now. And then when I look over to the side, you can always look at the bridge of the nose or you can just monitor the eye as it looks. But keep your focus on an eye. It makes it so much easier to communicate with people in the way that most people expect us to communicate with them. And in fact, uh, to all of you viewers right now, I want you to think about something. Everything I've mentioned, every bit of advice I've given, is for my kind to make your kind feel more comfortable. Think about that. You don't need us to look you in the eye. You want us to look you in the eye. It's a social expectation. We can look over here and just talk to you perfectly fine. It is not a big deal. In fact, I can imagine you're right there and just have a wonderful, lovely conversation with you, but yet you demand that we look at you directly. That's an example of how my kind are being forced to adapt to your kind while simultaneously not being understood. Like, you guys don't understand us. At all. Scientific community, uh, yes, you're nice, you're fine, you, you get all these experiments and whatnot. Have you ever interviewed somebody like me? In depth. Have you ever really gone into somebody's mind that knew how to describe what we're going through from a psychological perspective? And the big answer is predominantly no. All right, moving on. What can I do because my child never listens and I seem to be always nagging? Your child, it's not that your child isn't listening. There's a couple different things. Your child could either be rebelling or they could be autistic. Imagine that. And I mentioned the story before, but there was a time when my mother was absolutely yelling in my ear, not five feet away from me. I could not hear her because I was in the zone focused. I'll put it this way. If you can get an autist to focus, then we are absolutely unstoppable. Imagine taking all of this massive computing power and then focusing it on a single thing. But once you do that, or once we do that, um, it narrows our, our focus. It narrows our ability to, to multitask. And part of that multitasking is listening to you. So long story short, we claim that you're nagging if you have to repeat yourself and we've already made our decision. See, we don't have that social awareness to say, well, I have to do it because she said so or he said so. It's okay, does this make sense? Nope, okay, no. We're gonna ask why about everything because we wanna understand how it works and why it works the way it works. And we're gonna be asking you questions that you don't have the answer to. And the worst answer that you can possibly give a, an autist or an autistic child is because I said, God, I hated the answer. I hated it so much. Telling us because I said so, we are not gonna to listen to you at that point. And what that does is that diminishes you in our eyes. I'm like, oh, they don't know. I have to look somewhere else for that answer. Oh, they don't know. I have to look somewhere else for that answer. Oh, they don't know. I have to look. You get what I'm saying here? Is we develop patterns. We're, we're like a walking AI. Okay, we piece these patterns together. We collect information, then we correlate it. We take all this information over here and then just fit it together. And once we fit it together, it may not work in your favor. Like, let's just be real here. As kids, we will remember our conversations with you. And as parents, we will respect you more as little kids as early as five years old if you say, I don't know. That is okay. We will definitely remember it. So that's just something for you folks, you parents out there of autistic children to think about. It's okay to say, I don't know. We will have much more appreciation for you and we'll be more willing to ask you questions if you say, I don't know. All right, how early can autism spectrum disorder be recognized in children? That's actually a really good question. There are a 
couple different ways to recognize it, but to truly be able to diagnose it, you have to wait until the child moves beyond learning their environment. What do I mean by that? Because we're always learning our environment. What I mean is, is the child able to reason and communicate? That's about the start when you would be able to see, like traditionally be able to notice, okay, they aren't communicating or they are communicating. That's a clear indicator um, around the two year mark or so, like when children are generally expected to be able to talk. If you notice that the child is ignoring um, stimuli around them, like noises and whatnot, and they're just focused on whatever they're doing, then that's a decent indicator. But you have a bunch of symptoms that are going to be listed out. So diagnosing somebody as autistic before the age of, let's say at the very earliest three and a half, I think would be irresponsible because you have no idea how pronounced that autism is, or whether that child suffers from an actual disability or just simply being on the, on the autism side of the spectrum. And on the same token too, I mean, I'm going to voice my resentment for the psychological community because, I mean, we had electroshock therapy and lobotomy. Yeah, lobotomy is like going up your nose and snipping into your brain. We are still learning. Autism spectrum disorder is extraordinarily misunderstood because number one, it's in the name, disorder. It's not a disorder. It's just a different type of aptitude. A lot of you are socially capable. Like you're able to communicate with other people. You can manipulate other people if you want to. Um, you understand the situation that you're in with the people around you and the work environment, all of that. You understand that. What's the value of Planck's constant? What really is a black hole? You guys wouldn't be able to answer that. To my kind, well, for those of us with just a little bit of background information, that's easy. It's, it's actually really easy. Um, in fact, a black hole is probably the scariest thing in all of known existence. We just have a different type of aptitude. The fact that I can communicate with you as well as I can right now, and most of you can't tell that I'm autistic, I love psychology. And I've taken psychology to the point of turning it into a mechanism, which it really is. I mean, it's 3,500 years old, and you could trace um, viziers and magicians and all of that back to Mesopotamia, which were, was nothing but psychology and neurolinguistic programming. Like you hear a little bit of twang in my voice, you hear all these nuances in my voice, you see my mannerisms like this with my hand. That is a learned behavior. Like this emphasis I'm putting right here, that's a learned behavior. I'm not like that. I, I wasn't born like that. I was very mechanical. I was very stoic. My kind are, are a little bit different than your kind, but what you have in, in spades with social aptitude, we have in spades for mechanical aptitude. It's, it's very much like when one goes up, the other goes down. It's a scale. And I think that's um, under-respected. Last question of the day. All right, so check it out. I almost broke the fourth rule of business, which if you watch any of my business episodes, the fourth rule of business is take some time for yourself, right? So here is a question that I can't believe I passed up. What is the difference between ADD, ADHD, OCD, Asperger's, autism? Think of it like a sliding scale, okay? Number one, OCD is just a byproduct, okay? The more mechanically based you are, the more likely you are to exhibit signs of OCD. OCD isn't its own condition. And anybody that says that it is, well, um, OCD is just a byproduct. So obsessive compulsive disorder, you want order in everything you do. You want everything to be balanced. You want everything to be precise. And OCD is also, it's another symptom like hypochondria. My kind are prone to hypochondria if we start opening up WebMD. I mean, I happen to be a hypochondriac, but I've got it under control. It took a couple years to get there though. But yeah, the difference between us is a sliding scale. So think of it this way. The way that I, I mentioned them like ADD, ADHD, um, Asperger's and so on, that's just a sliding scale of mechanical aptitude. Because as you gain in mechanical aptitude, you lose in social aptitude. And so that's why the further you go on, the more, um, the, the more socially disconnected you got. It took a long time and it also took mentoring. Like there was a guy named Chris that um, in junior high, I'll never forget the fact that he took me under his wing because I was so awkward and he put me on my path to really connecting with people. And I've adopted many mannerisms that um, worked for me, meaning it made people more like, for example, a Southern accent. Well, that makes people a little bit more endeared, a little bit more uh, comfortable with you. 
it puts people more at ease. It disarms them, you know what I mean? And saying phrases like, you know what I mean? It, those phrases, um, they disarm people. And that's, that's a benefit for my kind. Because, don't get me wrong, y'all folks react a lot to, oh my gosh, they said something that I could potentially find offensive. I find that offensive, I don't like them. Like, we just don't care. The further you go along the spectrum, the further you go into it, um, you start losing social aptitude, and then right around autism, you start losing bodily aptitude, like control of your body, your motor functions, your speech. Um, speech is usually the first one to go as you're moving along the scale, and then you start losing control of your body, being able to walk right, um, or walk correctly, excuse me, and being able to control your hands, being able to control your speech, to control your tics. Because ticks are just our way of, um, hey, we're thinking about something, and or we've got all this stuff going on in the back of our heads, and, oh, we temporarily lost control of ourselves, or we engage in a repetitive motion to keep us balanced. And that's the best way I can describe that one. And I'm going to work on that one. It's a sliding scale. Psychologists and scientists haven't really, you know, figured those dif differentiations out. I mean, they have, but they haven't, you know what I mean? Um, but the fact that they don't see it as a sliding scale, and the fact that they don't see the spectrum as a wider diversity than what they currently label it as, that shows me that they still need to get somebody like myself or autists that know how to communicate what they're feeling and experiencing in a way that these psychologists can understand. Because there's a lot that goes on in our heads. I mean, we, when I say we're a supercomputer, you have no idea. You have no idea. Uh, think about a supercomputer with a whole bunch of pop-ups, okay? Eventually it gets bogged down and it makes certain processes a little bit slower. And those pop-ups, I mean, you gotta delete them, delete, 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 but that's kind of what it is to be autistic, is we get pop-ups left and right. Right now, I've got a ton of them. And those pop-ups, they reference um, things that are related. Like, if I say Hello Kitty, I, I like using Hello Kitty as an example, by the way. If I were to say Hello Kitty into my phone, this is the whole conspiracy theory that actually became true. Um, your phone, your TV, all of that's constantly listening to you. That's why you can say something and then all of a sudden you get new Amazon recommendations. Every Hello Kitty pop-up that can pop up, pops up when I say Hello Kitty. The history of it, the show of it, all of it, the keychains. I see all of it and I have to close all these freaking windows before I can focus on Oh yeah, I'm using Hello Kitty as an example to show how our minds are like a computer with pop-ups. And that's what it is, is <laughs> we, we've got all sorts of pop-ups going left and right. And the further on the spectrum you are, that, that's where ticks come from, is it's our, our body, you know, doing their, its own thing, like t -t -t -t, or maybe we're saying something verbally like da 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 One thing I used to do when I was a kid is I would say ding ding, random, you know, I'm processing through things and I'll just say ding ding and my best friend used to hate that as a kid and I caught on to that so nowadays I'll just you know randomly say ding ding just to take them off um, I fully have it under control but at the same time it's something that does require practice to control you know how you spin a basketball on your finger think of it like that the first couple times you're gonna fail you're gonna fail then you're gonna fail again then you're like oh you know what let me try something different you spin it this way and then you put it on your finger. Oh, that, that actually worked a little, ah, I fell off. You know, it's, it's gonna take practice and that's, that's what it did with me, is it took practice. A lot of freaking practice to minimize the ticks. Yeah, we have those ticks and that's just a simple um, loss of, I guess, situational awareness, but also bodily control. It's a loss of that because of all the information that's going on in our heads. I highly, highly, highly suspect my kind have a stronger relationship between our prefrontal cortex and our hippocampus. That means our processing center and our memory center of our brains. But yeah, that, it's just a sliding scale. That, that's the only real difference. And the further you slide on the scale, the more you lose socially and potentially mechanic, like bodily. Anyway, that was my guilty pleasure because I love complex puzzles. I love complex things that are difficult to answer, that are hard to relate to you guys. I, I freaking love that. I, I live for that. So yeah, this has been me answering questions. Um, if you have any questions of your own, put them in the comments. Share them with a friend. Maybe your friends have questions that they haven't had answered or that they want more clarification on. Let's do this. So be sure to like, subscribe, ring that bell if you want some more of this information or if you are interested in just different things I'm doing with, with autism and business and all of that. We're a little bit slower to learn social skills than you are. The same way some of you have a hard time learning mechanical skills, like math or science. We're all human. 
Anyway, I'll catch you next time. Be sure to ask any questions in the comments. I will try to answer as many as I can.